So, hi, welcome. I'm Gals. I'm one of the half dozen event committee volunteers, and we try and organise for you uh, once a month, or for our Leeds Civic Trust members, once a month, an event, be it a walk, a talk, uh, a visit. Clearly, no possibility of doing that at the moment. So um, we've got our virtual events going through. Before we start, can we just do a couple of housekeeping um, notes? Seemingly, if you want the best view, uh, John will be sharing some slides with great images. You have at the top of your screen where you see view options, you should be able to fit to window, make that choice, which will help you. Um, we've got about, we think about an hour's presentation with let's say 15 minutes questions and answers at the end. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat um, speech bubble. So do put your questions in there and I will do my best to field those. Um, we've also got Caroline Crossley with us, um, who if we have time, will give us a bit more information about some funding the Civic Trust gave to Hollybush last year. Um, so we've been trying to set this visit up for over a year since last year and I'm sure John and indeed Caroline are sick of emails from me. John has kindly conceded to do this presentation this evening. Um, we cannot obviously go and walk around the site. Uh, we can't go and eat their lovely cake in their coffee bar. Um, but we do have John, who is the business development manager for Hollybush Conservation Centre, which is based in a grade two listed building uh, down by the river bridge in Kirkstall. So, John is, uh, has been uh, custodian there for over 30 years. So I think there's not much I can tell you and there's everything he can tell you, not much he doesn't know um, on this virtual visit. So over to John. Right, let's share the screen. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming along tonight and uh, sharing your evening with us and not uh, choosing one of the many other online options that are available uh, in the world of uh, culture, arts and the rest. Um, either live screenings, I think some weeks I've actually been on three evening talks. <laughs> Sport for choice, even before you start going looking for things on YouTube. Um, the, of past presentations, indeed, I've watched a few past ones from the Civic Trust. So as Garant has kindly said, yeah, I work for the conservation volunteers and I was for uh, 30 years, one of the staff at Hollybush spent the last 20 years as the manager and changed over to this new role of business development about two years ago. And in fact, I cover England North, which is Liverpool to Hull or the Northern Powerhouse, if you prefer. Sharp eye people will spot me grinning out of this uh, photo montage from quite a while ago because the young girl who I'm holding in that picture is now about as tall as me <laughs> but uh, it's a nice picture all the same and um, people's postcode lottery is in the top corner because they kindly fund my post at the moment which means I'm here to do work in Leeds still supporting my colleagues um, and across the rest of the north as well so um, I'm going to why are we not getting movement here? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to give a little introduction to the conservation volunteers, talk about the building that we use and have managed for the last 40 years and then finish with an introduction to what happens there today. So the conservation volunteers, not knowing who's on this call and it's rather odd that I can't see anybody or recognize any old friends and acquaintances. Um, we were way back, the National Conservation Corps, logo on the left, it became BTCV in 1970 had the horse chestnut leaf logo at that period. In the early 80s, it became square. And in the late 80s, it became sort of leafy. And we occasionally got accosted by people for 
its resemblance to a certain legalized logo. Um, but uh, yeah, so some of you may have known us in past guises. In 2012, we became the conservation volunteers. Um, slightly odd one, but uh, we have the initial T in there and it only stands for the. So we are a national charity, um, operate throughout England, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, don't have any overseas branches anymore and sadly aren't in Wales. Leeds is a really important place for the conservation volunteers. Um, we have some of our longest serving staff in Leeds, three of us who've been around for 27, 28 plus years, Lucy, Caroline and myself, and 15% of the operational staff, I think it's about 27 staff on the payroll, are actually based at the two lead centres of Hollywood and Skelton. So we're really pleased to be here and it's a really important place for the conservation volunteers. So who are we? Um, so it's a national charity, working with people, communities, partners to deliver practical actions, lasting impact on people's health, prospects, outdoor places. So there are many environmental organisations um, all doing great stuff. We sort of fit in in being very people focused. We don't own any major nature reserves. We don't own historic properties. We don't do work with necessarily the headline attractive wildlife, you know, the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust for the Wildlife of Yorkshire, fantastic things that they do. They're actually about as big as we are nationally. So we're a small, relatively small charity, turnover of about eight, eight and a half million and working in a scattering of places up and down, down the country. But it's all about people, but everything we do has got a link to the environment. And it's all, in essence, largely social stuff, people work in groups. So they enjoy being together. They enjoy having that common interest in doing something good for the environment. Uh, there's roughly the dots we are. Um, I've been spread out a little bit so you can sort of see where where we are we have an office in Hull the York one seems a bit far north and then there's a huge jump from York up to Edinburgh and we go up to Inverness and sadly currently no further west than Bristol and but we do have quite a good operation over the water in Northern Ireland so we do stuff with communities we do stuff the one hidden behind the pictures on my screen around natural talent, which is about training people. We do projects around improving people's physical and mental health. And we do lots of things on places where things happen. So there may be nature reserves, there may be farmland, footpaths across the countryside, country parks, city parks, pocket parks in, in the city, a huge range. I mean, the team at Hollybush work literally from the Hollybush site all the way up to building a footbridge up at Homeforth. One of the things we do use is a concept developed by Mind UK, which is called the five ways to well-being, about connecting with people around you, about being active, discovering something you enjoy doing, taking notice of the world around you, taking time, as I did this morning on the allotment before work, to watch the wren that was hopping around in the trees. Learning things, there's always something new to learn or something to revisit or a skill to reuse, but also the idea of giving back and a lot of our volunteers talk about being part of a community where they get a lot of benefit from themselves, but they can all give and share either with their other, the other volunteers or with the people who will benefit from the site that they're working on. So, Hollybush. For those who don't know where we are, we are at the end of the River Bridge as you cross from the Morrisons, Kirkstall Bridge Shopping Park site to the Bramley Army side of the river. And that's literally the view from the traffic lights of the house took down below the road. It's a very difficult building I found over the years to actually take pictures of because it's a bit hidden. So that's the view from the lights. If you come down the road from um, Bramley coming in from Newley or Bradford, you go over the nasty S Ben Bridge and lots of trees and showing between the trees, certainly in the summer, there's an odd glimpse of a building. If you happen to get stopped by the traffic lights, you can see the gable end. And these days, um, a lot of these pictures have been culled out of the archives. It now says Hollywood on the wall and there's a big banner up there saying what we do. But again, it's, just, you know, it's one reason we put the name on the end of the building because people didn't know where we were. 
if you come down the hill from Bramley or come down the hill from Armley, you get this view of it from the bridge. So hopefully some of you have now recognised and orientated yourself to where, where we are if you didn't already know. OK, so I'm going to do a little bit of historical context here. Um, so we go back to sort of founding of the monasteries a thousand years ago and we've got the collection of Anglo-Saxon place names all ending in L-E-Y, L-A-Y, which are clearings in woodland. We have Kirchstall, the place of the church, and the red dot in the middle is Hollybush and sketched in there are the woodland clearings, but also that beautiful farmland in the bottom of the valley. And at that time, there was a road from Bramley to Headingley and a road from Armley down to the rid river bridge. And that was about it. And the monks came and established their abbey in a wooded clearing where the hermits lived. While we were doing the Hollywood 40 Years History Project, I did a bit of digging around in the local study section of the library and pulled this map out. Uh, the uh, librarian got the map out for me and it's a blueprint, hence it's white on black, of 1711 map of the estate of the Earls of Cardigan. And here you have the all the beautifully named fields as you get on enclosure maps and estate maps of that sort of period. And I've arrowed in there and you can there's a little building showing right in the corner there what says Netherbridge Close. And there's Monkwood, which the relict of which is actually, actually over here at the western end, still exists above Leeds Bradford Road after you go around the, the Espen Bridge here. The rest of it's occupied by Kirkstall Brewery residences. What was interesting to me was this field here down by the river is called Toad Hole, which was the name that we had for the tree nursery we had above the canal, roughly where Middle and Near Fall are. And we leased that from the council back in the 80s and gave it up about 10 years ago. If we go forward, Another 70 years, we get to the Toot map. I'm not sure of the origins of this. It may have been connected with the canal, because by this point, the Leeds Liverpool Canal that opened this stretch in 1770, and is such a key part of the recreations of Kirkstall these days, had been built. And here you can see what I think is the Hollybush Conservation, Hollybush Farm in those days, buildings, and possibly here what became the Station Hotel subsequently. And here you can see, oh, Monkwood appears to have disappeared on this map. Maybe it wasn't of interest to them, but, you know, we still have a lot of woodland, Bramley Falls and Hawksworth Wood, dating from all that woodland of the earlier period. Then the world began to industrialise, the dotty blue lines, the canal. And the railway came in 1840. Um, the brewery opened, I think, before 1800, and we have the other mills, Abbey Mills, Anne's Mills, Bernie Mills, and Benjamin Gott's mansion up on the hill. Um, you know, so I often thought, and I'll share a picture in a minute, you know, in geography, we, people used to talk about, I um, can't remember, Watford Gap, as you come up from London, where the canal, the railway, and the motorway are squeezed together by, by the geography. Well, the, Hollywood is probably the Watford Gap of Leeds. Um, this one was, I think, was about 1900, and still at this point, there were no buildings up going towards Bramley, not much here in the bottom, but there's a cluster of stuff, the brewery, we're here. Um, the station at that point was south of the bridge, then in 1904 became north of the bridge, and the cluster of buildings around the bridge pub and the mill, the mill there, Abbey Mills and so on. So it's still quite a rural feel, feeling place, probably. Um, and Hollybush actually had, we believe, some of the land over here and certainly the land um, here above the canal there and possibly some of the land between the railway and the abbey. A view that many of you may be familiar with, um, I don't remember where I got it, but I believe it came from the Evening Post, was someone went up in a helicopter on uh, Boxing Day 2015 and this was the extent of the flooding the morning after the flood. And I remember sit, sitting in a hotel room, I was down at the in-laws in rugby, 
watching YouTube clips of bins floating down Kirstall Road and people out in their canoes and thinking, crumbs, I wonder what's going on. Well, fortunately for us, the embankment of the Leeds Bradford Turnpike separates us from these fields. And by the following morning, the water had actually gone back from there. The water was here on with the lane. The water was in the railway. The water was coming up through the basement cellar, but it hadn't filled the yard. I think much to a lot of people's surprise, because people for a while kept saying, how did you get on? And we go, we were fine. So our volunteers helped out clearing up the bridge and the industrial units. And uh, we took a party up to Rodley Nature Reserve to help them because our neighbours were in need of help and we were OK. And for those who hadn't worked out where Hollybush is, that, that is where we are. Um, there's the house and the barn. And this lot here is the student flats that were built on the lower yard of the Kirstall Brewery. So Hollybush is a really, in many ways, insignificant building. Um, I've talked to people in listing who, to be honest, were slightly surprised it was listed. I think they just felt it had somehow piqued the interest of someone who was out in the area doing the listings of more notable buildings and decided in their wisdom that this particular relic farmhouse within the urban core was worthy of listing. And I've delved around in history quite a bit over the last 30 years at various points, not continuously, but now and then. I actually found this one this weekend, um, looking up some of the other Turner paintings. And in the notes, they, they describe this as um, Monk's Wood, which is where the, the brewery and the brewery flats now are. Um, and it's looking, it says, looking east to Armley Road Bridge. Well, I know the canal quite well. And the only bridge on our stretch of the canal where the road is at an angle is actually Broad Lane. So this might be the river bridge, though what that funny construction is, I don't know. I haven't checked the background for accuracy. So Hollywood is probably here. And this is fairly typical of paintings and photographs. They're close to Hollywood, but they're never us. Um, a better known painting, and we've got a copy of it, is this one of Turner's view of Little Lock of, at Kirkstall, which is the small lock just up towards Newley on our, from the centre. And this is the well, easily recognisable double bridge. And the detail of the round pier and everything is absolutely spot on. Um, this obviously is early 1823. He, he came back to Kirkstall for some reason um, to paint more of the Abbey and things. And, kept, and caught the moment when they were building part of the brewery building. And indeed, this house is known by some people as Turner's House, purely because of its appearance in this particular painting. Um, another view, which is in the City Art Gallery, shows you the rural setting. Uh, and obviously, 10 years or so after the railway came and it's captured the gate lodges on um, Redcoat Lane that runs down from what's now Stanningley Road, down the hill at the end of Gotts Park, over the bridge, and in fact has to go round the substation before going underneath the railway and coming out by Asda and what have you on Kirstall Road. Sadly, the two lovely little gate lodges are long since gone. But Hollybush is up here. So very much a rural farm landscape forming the backdrop to Benjamin Gotts, Gotts Mansion and the um, Repton Landscape Park around it. Indeed, maybe some of the landscape below us is as well, I'm not sure. If anyone listening is aware that I've dropped complete gaffes, feel free to uh, contact me and point, point it out because this is just a mishmash of things I've built up over the years from reading and talking to people. Um, the next part of the farm's history probably is in the 19th century, gradually forced rhubarb became a very popular thing and Hollywood changed from being a general farm into a rhubarb farm. And in 1870, in the trade directory of Kirkstall, Joseph Whitwell, gentleman rhubarb farmer of Hollybush House is one of the entries. And indeed on the 1900 or thereabouts OS map, the fields to the newly side of Hollybush is scattered with the little brick forcing sheds with the tar paper roofs that were such a classic of the rhubarb forcing scene up until the 1970s, 80s, when I think they fell into disrepair as rhubarb became less popular. And indeed, people weren't prepared to 
crouch doubled up in really low buildings working by candlelight and the modern forcing sheds at least allow people to stand up when not bending down to pick. Um, as I said, there are very few photographs of the, of the farm. This is actually a photograph of our outbuilding looking across to the brewery taken in 1919, which turned up on the cover of a history of the brewery written by the descendants of the Dawson family who had owned it in the 1840s to 60s. And I was able to the wonders of the internet to track down the woman who'd written it to her home in New Zealand and kindly ask her for a, a copy which came back down the wire. So there we have a picture of the outbuildings and um, Caroline will laugh, you know, I mean big piles of timber have often been the feature of Hollywood and hey, at this time there was a lot of piles of wood of something there. I'm not quite sure what it was but one of the Dawson family had served in the First World War and came visiting Kirkstall with his camera before he headed back home to see the family and there the photograph is. Um, very typically there are lots of photos on the Leodis website of the rebuilding of the bridge and in this case the resurfacing of the bridge. They nearly all point towards the bridge pub. This is one of the few that doesn't and you can see the house there at the end of the bridge. In a couple of photographs this extra gable appears here of which I know nothing and have not managed to, tra to um, track down and indeed it doesn't really fit with the other image that I've just showed you because yeah so there's something slightly odd it appears in a couple of photographs and not being able to track down on the ground or in other images what it might be um yeah much quieter bridge than the one we're all used to today and another view taken of shows the wharf with a lane with the uh, wooden crane for unloading the barges and the warehouse that was there the station hotel and our chimneys were hidden behind this building that still exists as part of the brewery. So not a lot of evidence in the past. So what I'm going to talk to you about is based largely on um, what we've gathered by looking at the building and doing work on it over the years and a certain amount of guesswork as archaeology often is. So the farming families moved out in about the 1950s. We have met descendants of them on a few occasions and we believe the council bought the site in the mid 1970s with every intention of building a roundabout to sort out the traffic. Um, that didn't happen and in the late 1970s the conservation volunteers were expanding, we were being very successful in South Yorkshire and feelers were being put out into West Yorkshire and someone that some of you may remember, Councillor John Sully, who I think passed away earlier this year was on an appropriate committee of either the city council or indeed the West Yorkshire County Council of the day and said oh I might know of somewhere. We've sub subsequently discovered that the parks department presumably because road schemes were going with the um, depression or whatever we call it of the late 70s, parks had actually started to renovate it and on two occasions it had been broken into during the renovation works and a lot of interior fittings and pipe work had been taken away and I've not heard this from parks but basically the park staff who perhaps were going to be based here as a parks depot said we don't fancy it. Um, so another solution was sought but this is a view of the front of it. I think shortly after we moved in because the barn doors open and this doorway here is boarded up rather than bricked up because there is a photograph somewhere of that being ceremonially literally removed of its breeze blocks when we actually took, took over. But this was what we took over and you can see the state of the stonework, all the pointing's gone out and it's looking rather sad and literally everything was bricked up. On the inventory at the handover, or just before the handover, the fireplaces were still in, in the main floor. By the time we actually got people on site they'd gone. So it just tells you some of the pressures. And there are stories in the 40 year history book of um, meetings with local youth and people who had been using it as their local den for glue sniffing and uh, what have you and at one of the events to mark the 40th anniversary someone came in in with their partner and she said he wants to tell you a story when he was 13 or 14 they used to nick barrels of beer from the brewery and tip them out into milk bottles get completely drunk and sleep it off in our bar <laughs> well he, he lived to tell the tale going around the back this was some some of the state of it and at this point the, the brewery at the back 
some pictures have got lots of barrels in there um but it was getting quite quiet and it later became a community program yard the outbuildings have somewhat deteriorated and the roof has gone um so it wasn't looking great and in fact we actually took that building down and completely rebuilt it to a slightly larger frame uh but on the same footprint and they there you go and there were still the um the sheds here where the soil was sterilized for putting the rhubarb in in the forcing sheds that was getting fairly shaky it was actually taken down some of the roof trusses from the photographs ended up being used in the rebuild of the outbuilding um a major part of our work at hollybush was actually funded by lots of manpower services commission um projects where unemployed people were paid a basic wage to learn skills and help with lots of useful things and there are lots of projects around Leeds where you can go yeah that was community program or you hear that that was community program and a lot of people of my generation were actually some of the youngsters on that scheme who then went on to have careers in the sector and this was a sign we found in the cellar um, which we had in the display for the 40th and if you're ever at Beamish Museum and you see one of these signs it might be this one because I decided at the end that it should be presented as part of social history as a record of all the people who served on that, that sort of program and Beamish who I think themselves partly benefited from community program agreed to accept it I mean it's four foot by nearly three foot so it's um, not something to hide in your loft or anything so it's good it's gone to a home because it was actually in reasonable neat because we never ever put it up someone decided they didn't want to have this enormous green sign outside a listed building and just ignored the request that said here's your sign please put it up to a uh, acknowledge the support you're having but lots of people came through and for a while there was sort of 20 odd people partly restoring the building partly running activities for the conservation volunteers all over Leeds and West Yorkshire and um, how we secured the building was a group of six or seven people actually moved in and people came and went but there was a hard core of about half a dozen people who lived for 18 months, two years, and actually undertook most of the building work. And if there are any health and safety engineer type people around, they recognize that was fairly flimsy scaffolding that was being used as they did important work of replacing the various lintels on the back of the house. And um, as far as I know, um, no one fell off those, but it certainly wouldn't meet any modern regulations. And, you know, some people learn a lot about building skills mainly by practicing and getting bits of it wrong and went on to have careers in the building trade and other people just had an amazing time uh, being part of that group and then went on to do lots of interesting things but basically we had done a fair physical restoration in three years of the house and the essence of the barn because by, as you can see there it's all been pointed up and they actually granted all the um the center of the wall because it was established that a lot of the infill had uh, eroded away over the years and uh, it was opened in 1981 or two by the chairman of the countryside commission so who became sir derek barber who was quite well well known so at that point we were getting huge amounts of money relatively from the countryside commission for all sorts of things and uh, yeah they were a great supporter through until probably the early 90s when the uh, agendas moved on i think we were fortunate at some point relatively close to us taking over the main house had been reslated because the roof um, on that picture looks fairly good and still is reasonably good today the barn roof was much shakier and uh, one of the final throws of the west yorkshire metropolitan council in 86 i think the spring of 87 somebody money was found to uh, take all the stone roof off turn all the slabs and re-timber it to make it sound which was immensely useful because i remember when i first parked park my car in there at weekends you were never quite sure how much the roof might be on top of your car when you came back back at the end of the weekend um other things happening at that time was there were community program running in kirkstall and as part of some of that work the first vision for the kirkstall valley park was put forward and um this sign was up somewhere and again ended up on the hollywood site um and that's our record of it but sadly the park is still to come to full full fruition so let's go and have a look at the building as we might have done had we had the opportunity to um show you round properly so this is the view as you come in off the car park and again i apologize 
I did go in and take some pictures the other week, but quite a few of these I've dug out from things. So there's a certain amount of uh, discontinuity for anyone who knows the site particularly well. Um, this is actually the front of the barn, and it's a classic barn. It's got various openings, um, some of which relate to when there were haylofts, and it's got a pair of big double doors that are in line, and you can you could in the old days, possibly before Broad Lane was where it, the level it is today, easily go in one door and out the other. Um, so, down to detail. Again, I may be wrong here, because a lot of aisle barns have the aisle post, the big timber vertical, standing on stone pillars. But I was told many years ago, and I've had it confirmed by other people, that these big stone blocks with holes cut in them that are in various places in one half of the barn floor are the aisle socket posts. So we believe it was originally an aisle barn. Um, and some of you may have had the opportunity to visit Stancor Barn up near the White Road Centre, and that's an example of an aisle barn. We think ours had four rows of posts from what we found in the floor. Again, I may be wrong, but Stancall is a wonderful atmospheric place that is open from time to time, um, depending on what's been going on. It's been open for Heritage Open weekends, I think, in the past, and is well worth a visit. The floor there is an earthen floor, which in fact must, most of Hol Hollybush Barn was, was when we took over. The stone slabs were apparently removed, I assume with some permissions, from the demolition of back-to-back -back terraces down by the viaduct on Kirstall Road, someone said, yes, you can have some stone slabs and the floor was laid, um, which has been quite useful. And the Nail Barn would have had a much steeper roof, and yeah, this is a much smaller barn, an like easy picture I googled of a, a thatch barn. And some people who know buildings better than I do have said you can see evidence in the walls of the barn that they were originally a much lower height. And some point in the Victorian period, the walls were raised and the modern Queen Trust sawn timber posts were put in. Oops, that was not there the way I expected it to be. But Hollywood has got lots of evidence of bits being reused. This is one of the doors at the back at the lower level. And the listing sites here that it was a barred window, and this is what this are. It does actually look like the top of a wall that had railings on it, but uh, yeah. But here you can see, you know, the lintel probably used to be higher at some point. But all over the building, there's evidence that people have altered stuff. And I've jokingly said at times, all we've done for the last 40 years is carry on this tradition of modifying the place so it suits the needs of those who are here, um, which I suspect is what the farmers and various people over the years before did. Um, okay. Um, other bits you can find on the back of the house is there's a bricked up doorway that matches this bricked up doorway and there's a pair of windows either side of them. Why we don't know, was it at some point two dwellings? The real mystery is if you were to unbrick that, you wouldn't walk into the room, you'd walk into a triangular fireplace that's been built across the corner of the room at some point, well, obviously after the doorway was blocked. Um, but the very bottom of the building is, and a lot of the barn, is this really big blocks of grit stone um, rather like the stone of the abbey. Absolutely no proof that any of it came from the abbey. It may just have come from the quarries at Bramley Falls or other smaller quarries long since lost in the local area. But yeah, later work, much thinner, smaller stone. It's a real jumble. The stone on the front of the house, and I'll explain why that is, is very fine sandstone. And it's very soft sandstone and in fact quite a lot of the front facade is actually coloured cement that was put in in the early 2000s to uh, make good all the wind and weather erosion on the front because we couldn't afford to replace it with stone patching and coloured mortar had to do and in fact if you don't know what you're looking at you can't tell um, and again here on the barn um, there appear to be a set of cornerstones here so was that there before this was Clearly there was a doorway there. You can see that this wall's got an incredible wobble in it. Um, possibly why this doorway was bricked up, I suspect in our era from the quality of the uh, masonry work there. And that's a view of the courtyard as it used to be with rather rough old sets. And one of the things that your grant helped with was sorting that out. Um, oh, here we are. 
So the big reconstruction, as we've surmised, is here in that this was the old level of the barn walls. The other thing we suspect, because when we um, ripped out the skirting boards in one of the rooms upstairs to put in dry lining insulation, we found, or the builder found and said, what's this, John? Was a beam at floor level, which clearly had been what's called the sole plate, which is the timber that's here at the eaves of the roof onto which all the rafters are fastened. And it appeared they'd taken the roof off and just built another layer. Another story on the building. Um, the story I've come up with is that possibly the road at the front was much lower when the early bridges were built. And eventually when the railway was built, and particularly when the railway was widened, the road level went up. And Joseph Whitwell said, I'm not having my house down below the road. I'm going to lift my front door to where it is, which is here. And I'm going to have a nice double fronted house fronting onto Broad Lane. And he employed somebody who I think probably had quite a wide brimmed hat to do the job and possibly cut a few corners because one of the other big bits of the VOB grant has been to sort out this gable wall, which was in severe danger of dropping off onto the barn or falling into the courtyard. And from what you can see inside the roof space, the inside face of that wall, I jokingly said, was made out of anything they could find in the yard or in the builder's yard, because it's a mixture of dressed stone, rough stone, brickwork, and Lord only knows what else. The other interesting thing is, you know, it's obvious that the, the house changed size over the years, the barn possibly changed size. The barn originally had a hip roof at this end, not a gable, is that where these red arrows are, these walls are actually almost entirely brick. There is a brick wall all the way up that side of the staircase and that staircase. And most of this gable wall is actually brick, certainly as far as we can see to the top of the barn roof. So, you know, when you see a builder building a stone house today, anything that's going to be hidden, you know, the footings, you know, internal walls, anything that's going to be hidden by the roof is always breeze block generally because it's cheaper and easier to build. Well, you know, that's not nothing new really. And what also amazes me is that these are literally just single leaf brick walls and the lower ones, because they're not plastered, there are long longitudinal timbers that stretch nearly the width of the house, which apparently was quite common at that period. Um, but to sort of see the whole building is resting on you know, something a bit more, so maybe a three before, um, yeah, not three by two, maybe three by four inch bulk of timber that, you know, has literally got bricks above and bricks below it. But we've had structural engineering studies, they're not phased by it, and it's stood for quite a while. So um, that's what we're thinking happened. Um, happy to be corrected by anybody who knows better. Uh, this is what I expected to find. So this is the modern roof structure in the barn, classic sawn timbers, Victorian period, queen truss roof, queen because it's got two verticals, not, if you had a sing, single centre one, it would be a king truss, queen, queen post roof, and as you can see, perhaps rather unsympathetically, when it was re-roofed in the mid 80s, um, yeah, it was plywooded to a uh, form of tight skin and the rafters that needed replacing were replaced by modern sawn timber and they couldn't get or didn't bother to get rafters that were a single piece. So lots of them have got joins in them because they were made out of two pieces. What you will see if you look up in the roof, if you're ever there at a meeting and are waiting for it to start, is there are a lot of reused timbers, you know, big stuff around of various sorts. And yeah, recycling was clearly part, part of their scene as well. Um, it's the barn today, that's the stone slab floor. Um, there is, as I said, this wall plate here. So that's why we think there was a, a hip roof at that end of the barn originally. There is a doorway behind where that door's propped up, which isn't doorway height on the inside of the barn and probably the lintel's probably only 18 inches above the present height of the track outside. So um, things have obviously changed over the years. Other examples of reused timbers, is in, so lintel for that window, or possibly it's actually the, the access door for the hayloft, but this massive piece of timber up above it, I guess, to spread the load from the roof truss, not sure. The very shiny piece of wood is what is a, 
heavy duty picture rail that was put up in advance of the Kurtzel Art Trail and has proved uh, very handy on multiple events for hanging things up and uh, makes the barn much more usable as a space. Um, a classic barn feature is between the two double doors is the remains of the brick threshing floor, sadly punctured by a vehicle pit that was dug in the 1950s when the site was used as a, um, a small garage business for a few years. And the mother of the lad who spent four or five months digging that pit once came to a jumble sale and said how cold it had been. Um, this is just some uh, honest patching that was put in 30 years ago to just say we can't at the time um, fettle up the brickwork. We'd had the floor collapse here because there was timber underneath and needed to rot it out. So um, I'm afraid I bought some concrete pavers at the time and just made the floor safe. And that's the way it stayed subsequently. Um, about five years ago, we replaced all the barn windows as the ones from the 1980 restoration had rotted through. We also took the opportunity to fit shutters to the back of them so we can actually open them to let the light in at special events. Um, but equally keep out people who would periodically try and break in. Um, and that was done on one of our woodwork courses as an exercise, building non-opening windows and creating shutters and fitting everything. So a great example of volunteers still helping to look after the place. Um, so we now come out to the front of the house and there you can see this very fine stonework on the front. And interestingly, Mr Whitwell didn't get himself a classic mirrored house there are two principal rooms on each floor, one either side of the main doorway, but the rooms this side are much nicer because they've got two windows. The ones on the other side are rather dark because they've only got one. Um, one of the things that's featured on the list, no, that's going inside the house, got the order slightly wrong here. He did fit himself a very fine staircase in the hallway and had all the principal rooms beautifully laid out with uh, plaster ceiling roses and coving which means, one of the things it does mean is we can't dry line these rooms because all the internal plaster work is part of the listing and we would obviously compromise that if we put four inches of rigid foam on the walls to try and keep the heat in. And that is actually the former billiard room of the Whitwell family. Um, normally our meeting room, but in the current period has become an office full of stuff. <laughs> if you run activities, you've got loads of stuff and it's, uh, yeah, these tidy in a way. We, while the cable was being repaired, we had to empty some of the upstairs offices and the contents of their shelves have been parked up here through lockdown. Um, going down to the basement, um, very different view. The ceiling down here is much lower. Um, the principal rooms have got beautiful high Victorian ceilings. Um, at just under six foot, I can just get under that beam. And that's the space that we use as the cafe. Going down further, there is a cellar below, which is the one where the water comes up through the floor. And in fact, I think at the time of the Kirkstall floods, the water came somewhere up to here. And what you're seeing in here is the impact of all that water and bubbling, bubbling the plaster off. Um, I guess it was the deep storage for the farmhouse at the time. But here you can see flight of stone steps, but there's been a, an arch put in to hold up one of the walls and the wall put up in here to hold up the room next door. That might have come from when the Whitwells created the two principal rooms at the front on, each, on, the, on the floor above. I suspect redivided the interior. They may have taken the whole of the interior out at that point to uh, set, set it up as a gentleman's residence rather than what may have been two farm cottages at some point. This is a tiny bit from the listed building entry. So house and bar, now offices, wall and railings to the roadside and some suggested dates. It lists that doorway made out of bits of re reused stone. And it lists that tall front wall with the rounded top and it lists the railings at the front. Um, I think ages back when I was much less appreciative of buildings than I am, am now, we were sort of cursing this because it meant all the repairs to the railings had to go all the way through listed building and be properly approved. That was after someone drove a car through one side of it. Um, these are the original railings. They're cast metal verticals set through a punched iron bar, apparently quite common practice. And each of these, there's actually a break. That's where the castings break. And they were set in lead along the stone wall. The other side, I said a car went through it and made quite a mess of it. Um, so we had to get 
some railings made probably 20 years ago, in fact, and they managed to source some punch metal strip and they fabricated the verticals. But interestingly, they put the square bar in the lathe and turned the top and then welded a detail bobble on. So if I go back, if I can go back, you can see how these are put much heavier, square sectioned. Yeah, this, this, this is a sand bed casting, I think. Whereas the replacement is close enough. Um, and what we went for, in fact, was a bar along the bottom because people tend, don't tend to lead things in anymore and it's bolted to the wall. Painted black, the casual passerby who isn't too obsessed with detail doesn't spot what we've done and everybody was happy. Unfortunately, modern steel railings rust rather worse than the uh, old cast iron ones do, but it all needs a bit of a clean down and a paint job. The gate had long gone and had two incarnations in timber and as part of the, the earlier project that I'll come to in a, in a little while, it's been replaced and they've done a pretty good job in following this style and uh, fitted it. Um, we just need to tidy up the long galvanised bolt hinges and possibly paint it white to match. So uh, yeah, all that stone pillars is all a key detail part of the listing and as it's grade two, the listing really focuses on the outside of the building. To give some examples of the conundrums of managing this building, we'd like, there are four steps down from that gate into the garden to the front door. We'd like to put a ramp in. And we've had someone do a study and basically ramps can't be too steep. So it goes to the right and it turns round and it goes to the left and it turns round and then it comes to the door. Oh dear, we've lost nearly all the garden. From the road, you won't be able to see it, but hey, not an ideal solution because the garden is quite beautiful and makes a nice entrance, something nice to look out onto um, for people who are working at the front of the building and yeah, it's all what we're about and people enjoy looking after it. So you'll see here that the pavement drops. So one suggestion might be is if we can put a new gateway here, we've got less height to lose in the ramp and we can keep more of the garden. But the key question is, will listed building accept this as a suitable compromise to ensure the building is fit for the modern day? Well, time will tell. We're just waiting on something else to be decided before we dare ask them another question. But if that came off, bearing in mind we've got to get around the lamppost, we can come in through here, make another little gate in a suitable style and have a single ramp that goes round the garden and we'll leave most of the garden intact. And the ramp largely from people from the pavement and road will be pretty hidden. Well, time will tell in a couple of years, we might've got it through planning and raised the money to do it. Um, okay, so that's, that's the building. I've talked about the outbuildings a bit. That was done before I started. I don't know too much about it other than we knocked the old building down, made it into lots of nice piles and got at least to where that picture was of a part built structure before Somebody went past and said, oh, not seen a planning application for that. So there was then a flurry of a retrospective application. <laughs> but there you go. We learn, we tend to put applications in these days um, and do it through the proper processes. And if you're not familiar with listed buildings, that means getting permission from the landlord, putting a listed application in, putting in a planning application and waiting for everyone to decide in the appropriate time. So nothing happens very quickly. Um, we built a bike shed in 2012 um, because we wanted to move the bikes out of a small room that was about eight foot square, whereas if you came in first and then wanted to leave before the end of the day, it was a bit of a nightmare. So we thought, let's have a proper bike shed. And then planning said, ah, you can't just put up a bit of corrugated felt or whatever on a simple wooden frame. We want something nice. So we ended up with a green larch sawn frame with a sedum roof on top of it and doing a self-build instead of costing about eight, 800 pounds cost five grand in materials and yeah went through all the processes but we now have I'll hazard it hazard one of Yorkshire's finest bike sheds <clears throat> and here we are doing a self-build um, we've got steel stanchions being fixed to the top of the wall that hides the fact we had to dig under the wall and put get a builder to put some big concrete blocks in to take the extra weight put some concrete blocks in along the along the back wall, they're about 0.6 of a metre cube. And then basically 
from a w wonderful uh, chap called Keith, who's based up at Old Slenningford Farm, whose workshop I'd seen and thought, hmm, that's a neat structure. Um, that, might, that, that might be copyable as a bike shed. And Keith works with Larch from the estate. And he said, yeah, we can do that. I can provide you with the kit. And he knew someone who knew about structures because we had to convince building control, if I, I forgot to mention, that it would stay up, particularly if it had a foot of wet snow on top of it. And this friend of Keith filled three sheets of lined paper with some calculations that reminded me of school calculus and uh, said bits of wood need to be this big, which was interesting because they were quite a bit bigger than Keith's bits of wood on his outdoor workshop. But he got through. I think Keith paid him a bottle of whiskey for those calculations. But it convinced building control and away we went. And over four weekends, with a lot of help from volunteers, I led a team who built it. And I think about 40 people helped. I really enjoy making buildings, as you can probably tell. Um, but I also enjoy giving people the chance to show that even with not much skill, you can, as a team, create something and create something that is really, yeah, quite amazing. Um, and there's a view inside it today. It actually holds 20 bikes from one end to the other um yeah and it's quite a beautiful place and we resist temptations to make it into part of the cafe or in fact there was one suggestion that um we glazed it and some offices were put in it but we need somewhere to keep the bikes and on occasions it's actually more than full um that's a view of it on the outside um yeah being used to store things at the far end at the moment um and we get lots of wildlife on top of the season roof a very different building was the following year. Um, we had decided to do more green woodwork and we needed somewhere to keep the equipment. So we thought, hmm. Well, actually, I've been watching the, some of you may know it, the, um, I think what it was, series that became the Victorian and the Edwardian farm. The first one was called Green Valley, I think it was. And in that, they built a small hut out of round wood timber. And I watched that and I watched, watched a video by, um, Ben, who runs the wood, um, all the green woodworking stuff down in Sussex, he was on the Grand Designs when he built his triangular house. So I watched some of his films, thought, yeah, we, we can do this. So we got some round wood, and um, interesting with that is nothing is square, you can't square off anything, and it's quite interesting to make a rectangular structure. When you get to the roof and you decide you're going to put corrugated iron on because we're not going to do thatch, you've got to convert from round wood to flat surfaces. So yeah, did that. And the foundations were rather simple this time. We just dug some little pits in the ground and then we upended some big plant pots and cast some little blocks of concrete. And it cost rather less. It actually took probably longer to build because of the complications. Um, this was early on, a lot of round wood waiting to be uh, used. Realized we needed some longer bits. So we went up to the old toad hole nursery with permission from the council and now look after, well, it went back to the uh, parks department. We said, look, ash dieback just come. Is it okay if we go and fell some ash? So we fell some ash and we tipped them in the canal and floated the logs down the canal to Hollybush. It's amazing when you do things on the canal towpath that are out of the ordinary, how many people just completely ignore you and try and pretend that they're just walking their dog and nothing is happening, but hey. So this is Ralph and myself towing the main beams down the lock spillway because we didn't have a lock handle to lock them through. Um, when you work with round wood, the first thing you do is you peel all the bark off. And those two children are now uh, 13 and 15 and probably wouldn't cooperate, but they're actually quite good at peeling bark. So uh, there they were for a couple of weekends because they were too small to be left at home. So we, you peel it because the bit immediately under the bark has gotten the most sugars in. And if you leave it on, fungus has a field day. So you peel it off. And ideally you fell the timber in the winter when the sugars are down. Um, the sap has gone down into the base and they're less good habitat for fungus. And you make some joints. Um, that's the main frame upside down freeze of assembly in the barn. Very handy when it's cold and wet. And there's the structure put up. The observant will know that we cheated a bit at the back and instead of having beautiful timber joints, which are quite a challenge to cut on round, we had a few bits of piping with flattened ends from some polytunnel frame or something that was set, we got left behind. So we use those instead at the back for ease. Um, and there is, well, Peter who put the roof on called it Pondview Hall. I call it the Bodger's Hut. Um, used for destroying the green woodwork stuff. Little bit of a dumping ground at the moment, I'm afraid. But it has been used at public events. 
including on one, a couple of occasions, it's been Santa's Grotto at one of our Christmas nighttime events and a lovely part of the setting when it's been set dressed. A very different building was the Roundhouse in 2015 and it's completely different from either of the previous ones. It's made out of prefab structural panels which are basically were built by a company called Hector and Cedric and we eventually asked them who are, who's Hector and Cedric and Jack who'd taken over the, build, the business from his father after a, about a decade or so said well actually when it was set up we had a tortoise and a cat in the family who were called Hector and Cedric and indeed that's what their logo is and they have a lovely workshop that's in the woods at um, just up the valley from Abbeydale in Sheffield and I can't for life remember what it's called but hidden below that are some mass concrete foundations that go down six foot. Um, never take out a large tree that's got its roots in clay in the year before you build a building because the civil and the structural engineers will say the ground will still be adjusting to the change in the water regime and you have to go really deep. Um, and it was a profession, professional build, the volunteer team had nothing to do with it apart from the lean-to kitchen at the back that we built onto it. And it cost an eye-watering 55,000 and took me four years to raise the money. Um, we created a model to explain to people what it was going to look like and it originally featured a little wood stove that eventually didn't happen because the volunteers felt they couldn't. It would cause more problems than, than it would solve and someone might misuse it and get damaged and well I didn't have 4,000 quid so we didn't get one anyway. Um, we had some sponsored walks and that included a go at the Three Peaks. I think this isn't the Three Peaks but it was one of the practice hikes for people doing the Three Peaks as a sponsored walk. Um, Rachel Reeves introduced us to uh, the MD at Talk Logistics up in Armley who have a charity of the year and they kindly eventually gave us a total of 7,000 and that was Stuart and Rachel doing a photo call with me. Um, Hollybush is on the coal measures and um, in the planning process we discovered that uh, we'd have to demonstrate to the coal authorities satisfaction that there were no old coal workings underneath it that might subsequently collapse. And I had a quote at one point for £12,000 to bring a drilling rig onto site to do the holes. But by chance head office had just employed someone who used to work for the coal board as our property manager for the whole of the country and he used it's in Doncaster and he used to work for the coal board and he knew a few guys from up on Tyneside who had a little business going around doing low-cost drilling so they turned up for a day with their little portable drilling machine and some rods and everything and they did the job for 1800 pounds so um yeah if you ask around and have friends you can get there Eventually we raised the money for it and there's a lot of logos for the big funders and a lot of li lists of names of the smaller funders down to the five pound roof tiles. To sh and it was actually really important that we had all those individual donors because I think they really convinced some of the later funders to help us over the line. What really got us over the line was it being part of a major lottery programme we, we ran and that stumped up about a third of the money. Um, so this is the big funders this was the build. It all went up in a day. It arrived on a lorry with this amazing hydraulic crane and the four lads from Hector and Cedric put 16 panels in a ring, fastened it together, put a platform in the middle, put the framework for the roof light on and then put the 16 panels for the roof round out. And at about six o'clock they hammered the last one in and the crane driver thankfully left. He thought he was only staying for an hour. He'd been there for seven hours. Um, the lads went to the pub and had a few pints, I think. And uh, yeah, four months later, we opened it. Um, this is, I'll keep going with the speed. A um, lot of small trusts, lots of uh, in memories of people, um, all the sponsored walks, the band nights we held, the Christmas and Halloween nighttime events, collection buckets, 150 individual donations, and four donations in memory of volunteers who died before their time. So, yeah, very poignant event when we had Phil and Mina, or Phil Corrigan, who was the chief exec of the Leeds CCG at the time, and um, Councillor Jane Dawson, who was the Lord Mayor at the time, came and did the honours jointly at the opening ceremony in the September of 2017. So it's been with us three years. Time flies. 
and is now used as an amazing setting for all sorts of events. Um, and uh, the circle really works. There are no corners to hide in. And we spent a bit of money putting a carefully cut patterned stone floor in because, yeah, it gets muddy boots and all that sort of stuff in it. So anything else was going to get hammered, to be frank. And um, I made a stained glass window to uh, commemorate 30 years of being at Hollybush and a change of job. And that's what it looks like on a nice sunny day. Um, I couldn't get in to actually move the uh, willow wigwam that was parked in front of it, but that was okay. So the last, the last project I need to talk about is the Veolia um, landfill funding, which was a piece of work that Caroline secured when we were invited to bid for some, a large Veolia landfill trust pot which um, I believe they needed to uh, spend quickly. And fortunately, we ended up with a program costing 300,000 and were able to do all sorts of things that have been on the wish list for years. One of which was to pin that gable wall together, which will have absolutely no visual impact, absolutely no utility other than we can reassure the insurers and the property manager who were concerned that it might collapse one day, that it won't and won't for a good while, but um, I believe it's cost us 60,000 quid to achieve that with a lot of specialist drilling, rock bolting and super glue of the um, sort of building hold it together brigade. But we've also managed to replace all the gateways and railings, which were a whole mishmash of things from 1979 onwards that had been built over the years to achieve certain security goals, because for a while it was known as Fortress Hollybush because every three or six months someone would break in and often not manage to steal anything or sometimes they did steal something and I had a policy of always spending at least the insurance excess trying to make it more difficult the next time that someone tried to get in and eventually we got to the point where people very rarely got in, um, touch wood. Um, the other thing we've done is we've done a lot of work on the surfacing because all those rough cobbles are very pretty but when you have lots of volunteers with learning disability and physical disability or forms of dementia that affect people's depth perception, they become a hazard. And we have lots of people whose mobility is really poor. So it became really important that we have level bump free surfaces all over the site. It's not very exciting and lots of things won't fund that because it isn't exciting. Funders, you know, if they give you 5,000 pounds, they want something which they can proudly put their name to and quite right. But so that's why it's a really important fund for us. It's enabled us to achieve huge amounts of stuff. So we now have a nice tarmac entrance. We wind it so there's a passing point where bikes and pedestrians can get out of the way of the bigger vehicles. And like you do in sort of safer streets and things, we've, we've got a painted distinguished surface saying this is the pedestrian route. Tries to make it feel that, you know, visiting cars, sometimes taxis, sometimes delivery vehicles will try and see how fast they can get down our little driveway. I jokingly say sometimes that this gap here beyond my bike here was they measured the biggest farm cart of the day, marked out that plus six inches either side, and they sold this land from the farm to the brewery. And that's the brewery perimeter wall because you can just get a full size HGV through that gap, but only just. Um, this is a view from the other end. We'd had for many years an eight foot high deer fence that uh, we put up to create an inner compound in the days of the Hollybush Tree Nursery and Wildflower Garden before we had a big fence on the canal side. Basically the back of the site was open to the canal and um, you know, inevitably some of the people who wandered in out of hours or even during hours weren't too respectful of what on. So we created that inner security compound. Well, the, the wire fence was probably on, on the way out. So we've now got some really nice permanent railings and the whole of this courtyard is now properly drained, smooth, so, surfacing which is brilliant for everybody i mean we have people who come to the woodwork project and other projects who use various walking frames wheeled and otherwise who use wheelchairs or use mobility scooters and yeah it was a bit of an obstacle course and really not that suitable for them so it's been really great to achieve that and all around the garden we've now got this lovely gravel flexi paving um we've taken out the surfaces and it's going to be really good for everyone to get around once lockdown is properly over and we can get everybody back Another view of the inside of the courtyard. Um, the scaffold is still up for the gable end. We haven't quite finished it. Um, this space here is where the cafe shelter used to be. And is, I think, 
week or two, Caroline will confirm is finally, we've got it all through planning. The new cafe shelter is going to be put, put in there, ready for us, hopefully reopening the cafe before too long. That's the old cafe shelter, which was actually four enormous pallets, six, seven foot by eight foot, that had been repurposed from the local um, printing works that print enormous plastic signs and had a couple of wooden beams and the 15 pound tarpaulin put over it and it did very well for 15 years but it was time to replace it before it started before the pallet started to rot and it fell down of its own accord lots of paving around the polytunnel so we can now get you know mobility aids all the way around to the various places and there's good level access for everybody um and that's just to remind me to mention the gable and another building that we've created down the end of the garden where we had a parachute tent for um, running various sessions underneath. And we're in the process of creating, sort of called a, the bird's nest by some people, or I tend to call it the wood henge, which will have walls around one side and a view into the woodland garden on the other side and some form of roof on it. And just be a little bit more presence and yeah atmosphere than the parachute tent was that sort of sagged down from the trees and needed to propping up all the way around to make a nice space so that's in the process of being created and once again for durability concrete base metal stanchion then the woodwork so hopefully the wood stays out out of the damp and the wet and lasts a good long time because they're untreated large where next ah toilets probably even more unattractive at one level to fun than surfacing um we can have 50 60 50 60 people on site on a busy day many of them don't like the stairs or they wear muddy boots and we don't really want them in the building we have one ground floor toilet that when it blocks is a real problem there are two toilets on the middle floor and one right on the top floor up the carpeted stairs jokingly called the executive bathroom so the next plan is to build a proper toilet block with another accessible toilet and three separate three or four, probably four separate toilets, I think it is. So we really will have plenty of toilets. And at the moment with the COVID regulations, and we don't know how long this is gonna go on for, obviously everyone hopes the vaccine is the silver bullet that makes life get back to normal, but it might not for a while. And we've currently got the site divided into four sections and each site's got a designated toilet, two of which are portaloos, just so we can keep people apart. And obviously with this, we'll be able to, if we have to in future for any emergency, designate toilets per group and also just, yeah, there'll be less queues for the toilet. And if we're running big public events with 300 people on site ever again, it'll be much easier. So, Caroline, <laughs> you want to come in and talk numbers? I'll have a break. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'll, um, um, I've uh, had the very good fortune to um, move into Hollybush in the last uh, sort of 18 months and um, pick up on some of the creativity and projects that John um, has led on for many, many years. Um, I'll just very, very briefly um, sort of explain that Hollybush is an incredibly vibrant and busy um, place, which if any of you pop down, can't um, miss all the, the hive of activity that's going on throughout the gardens and in the yard and the woodwork projects and our classroom full of adults with learning disabilities and a cafe. And yeah, there's so much going on there. Um, and as John sort of uh, put the numbers here, we basically uh, work with about sort of 12,000 people a year um, or just attendances, people coming to some of the different sessions, um, including 5,000 visitors that pop in and come through the site. Um, we've got quite a big staff team um, and again, just a very um, creative, resourceful, um, welcoming and delightful uh, group of people um, and uh, and that includes the voluntary staff that we have as well as the paid staff. Um, TCB's had a long tradition of uh, people volunteering with us um, at all sorts of levels and contributing so many different skills and experience to, to what we do. Um, John I think you're in control of the screens, can you just keep sort of pushing it forward. Yeah. Um, 
yeah if you just whistle right the way through I'll just keep chatting and uh, and so on but it's it's incredible really how much we do we've got um on site we've got our practical conservation team who do work in our gardens as well as right across West Yorkshire we've got um, green gym projects which are focusing on health and well-being and so we do walks, we do litter picks, we do mindfulness sessions, we help um, groups developing allotment sites. Um, we've got a specialist um, program called Time to Shine, um, which is working in conjunction with Leeds Older People's Forum and the Lottery um, to, uh, to sort of encourage people to um, have a healthy and active um, later life and um, and engage and share their skills and knowledge with some of the younger people coming through Hollybush, which has been a real success. And we're delighted to announce that we've just got another year's funding for that, uh, which is exciting news. Um, so we've got training courses. We do a lot of community learning. Um, so we've got gardening projects. We've got woodwork projects. Um, we do we teach skills like dry stone walling and surveying and so on. And um, and just in the middle of that, we've just got this beautiful site that, as you can see from John's um, talk, has got a wonderful history. And uh, and I think important to recognise it's something that's not sort of preserved as a museum piece. It's uh, it's something that certainly acknowledges its history, but it's always been a working site um, as a farm and now as a, a community hub um, where we've got groups of people conserving and caring for green spaces, but also caring for people. And, uh, and that's something that I think is massively important to all of us. Um, as you can see from this list here, there's so many people have supported us, including your good selves, and, uh, and that's something we're very grateful for. Um, running the operations we do in Leeds for the numbers of people we do, and as I'm sure many of you know, looking after an old building isn't a, a cheap option. Um, and so we do rely on all these um, sources of support over the years, and it's not just money, it's people's time and skills and experience. Uh, that they contribute to what we do and even just the people saying you're doing a good job um, it makes uh, what we do uh, absolutely worthwhile and um, yeah it's a cracking group of people and as soon as we're able to we would be absolutely delighted to welcome you um, to Hollybush and to Skelton Grange and to meet the people who make it all work and um, yeah Come down, have a cup of tea, we'll show you around and um, yeah, be really good to show you. So I'm sure John and I'd be delighted to answer any questions that you've got. Um, otherwise, um, we can come back or we can meet you in person and show you around the site. Hey, thank you so much to both of you. That is absolutely astonishing. Um, you clearly are doing the most amazing job. Um, I think it's the multi-skilling that John was explaining, not just him, but obviously the team that you have working with you, the flexibility, the ingenuity, how you get the fundraising, who knows? Unbelievable, thank you so, so much. I mean, we've got lots of thank yous and I noticed that some people are rushing off for their supper because they've got rumbling tummies. So no pressing questions yet, but I've got a couple of wrap up things to think. So yes, okay, so we know, we know where Hollybush is. We've got the contacts there. Thanks, John, that's brilliant. Um, so as far as the Civic Trust is concerned, obviously really, really grateful, uh, hoping that we will get a spring stroke summer visit, John and Caroline, if you can, well, who knows what's going to happen next, but we're working on it. Um, for other attendees, uh, we do have another event this month, which is our AGM for members who can have a book on Eventbrite. Um, Stop Press, we, our next event in December is Ivy Benson, who um, her biographer, Janet Tennant, is launching a book on her. She was the woman who had her all-girls band 
and we're calling it Sax Appeal, Ivy Benson and her All Girls Band, and why not? Uh, so those of you who are not yet members, if you'd like to have a look or join, you can contact our office, office at leadscivictrust.org.uk. We're recording this on the cloud, so when it's been sorted out, it will be available on the Civic Trust website. So I hope, John, you're happy to share all your slides and Caroline your chat um, so others can hopefully benefit. I think the word will go round. I think very few people are aware just how much goes on there and just what a wonderful job you are doing, which could not be better positioned with all the well-being that is going to be required. You're going to be such busy people as if you weren't already. So it's well past our finish time. I'm going to bring it to a close. Hurrah, thank you both and all the people you work with for doing such an amazing, having such an amazing place, space, and what a brilliant project. Thanks a lot. Take care and good night to you all. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye.